In this fifth study, we have finally some fast notes accompanying a simple melody, a pretty typical way to arrange uh, not just music for right hand only, but really a lot of uh, pieces where you need some motion in the music while projecting the melody, providing harmony, so you get these sorts of um, these sorts of textures. So in in this particular instance, what's important to remember is despite these notes being written as fast moving eighth notes, the con conception should not be different from all the other more chordal arrangements that we have covered up to this point. So in other words, before you start the first beat, all four notes are ready, as if you're about to play this. Well, you happen to be playing this. You could also play this. In other words, you can use this position in many different ways to create different kinds of texture. So all the way through to the end of this study, the eighth notes mean nothing because as long as you properly adjust your position, you will be able to navigate through these notes just fine. So in fact, let's start by playing them as blocks. In the beginning, if you uh, prepare your position this way, of course, it means you instantly have to do this. Well, you couldn't do it instantly. That's perhaps the only difference between block chord arrangements and arpeggiated arrangements. You kind of have to move as you play. To this end, if your hand stretch allows it, I would highly recommend starting in the middle of the keyboard, in, inside the keyboard. Now it's a little harder to do because fifth finger playing inside the key at this angle is not necessarily the easiest thing, but if you can do it, then I would recommend doing it. So that way you instantly land in the next position without needing to do any inside the keyboard motion. And another thing I guess that makes arpeggiated patterns on piano a little bit different from just block chord type of texture is that even if your hand is a little smaller, you can still do this. You can still stretch as far as you can. Let's say you cannot go all the way down to E with the thumb. Let's say it can only rest on F. Well, that's not a big deal because you start going through from the top down and as you progress, you can adjust your finger locations very slightly. Now, that might be your initial position, but it's okay because as you go down, you find that E natural with your thumb. So yeah, a couple of differences in practice when it comes to playing arpeggiations but the approach should be, as much as possible, the same as if you were playing it like this. Because if you can do it, you should not have any problems doing this. gone through preparing positions in advance in all the previous studies and therefore I'm not going to spend too much time talking about it but just remember these fundamental concepts of either playing on the outside of the keys or inside the keys as you uh, remember about where the thumb has to travel so but in this case you also have to remember where the fifth finger has to travel 
right, so that's... If, if, if I played it like this, then you could probably play like this. And just get rid of all those sharps, pesky sharps. But with the sharps... final measure of this line, measure four, make sure to go over the thumb with the two and don't let go of that anchor point. So this really helps you to get right back to the necessary notes at the very end of the measure. All right, let's keep going. Just checking. Yeah. Um, so far you've noticed that my top notes have the tenuto mark on them. So probably you end up playing the top, the tenuto notes with a bit of a mezzo forte dynamic and the non tenuto accompanying notes would be more like piano. The average result is mezzo, uh, mezzo piano. So therefore just keep that in mind. Here in measure five it reverses and so you start by playing quietly bringing out those tenuto notes in the bottom. Some mysterious sound and harmonies there, but uh, for measures five and six, it is actually possible, given the tra trajectory of the passage, to bring the thumb out from being inside the keyboard to being more on the edge. Then here, by this point it could potentially play on the edge of C and then makes it maybe a little bit easier to articulate this passage on the outside except for this moment so your mileage may vary on this one that sudden shift in inside the keyboard might be a little bit uncomfortable so as for me when I consider the having to do this and weigh it against the difficulty of playing inside a keyboard. I sometimes do a compromise, so come out a little bit. Maybe to the middle between the black white border and the edge right here. Let's call it um, M for middle, so holding the thumb here on M, you know, I'm not trying to play here, but I am, I am here, so then when the time comes, pulling it up to that A flat in the end of measure 7 is quite doable. So these are the, the kinds of things that sometimes, if you really plan it out, make a difficult passage quite possible. Yeah, I, I keep wanting to change to the fourth finger on uh, the end of measure six and really I shouldn't do that because it's nice to feel anchored with finger five on that A flat. This is a perfect passage where, because of some tricky and unusual position changes, I would practice it backwards. So I need to be here, 
at the very end of measure seven. So let's just find those notes. Okay. After you find them, the trick is you're with finger two on C going towards this position. So play C and then do this. And really exercise this slight adjustment of your position. Okay. Once you're here, you know you can go on and do all, all of the rest of it. But from here, do that. Now add finger one on that B double flat. I apologize for all the uh, double flats, but we are temporarily in the key of D flat major. Right? Just do that. Start on B double flat, go into C and move. So kind of combine now a couple of things together. Okay. Then finally, the trick would be to, uh, so let's say you agreed to keep the thumb on that M point in the middle of the white key. Um, you play the three on the A flat right before that B double flat, and then you do this. Now that probably is the most crucial part of this passage, being on three uh, on A flat, and then doing this move. So notice that if things get particularly gnarly and difficult, I don't try to do, you know, all of the all of the notes. I just say. Three is on A flat. I need to be in this position to play the rest of this passage. So let's just practice that. The same way we were practicing for beat four. That's the position we need to be in. That's where we were stopping. Now we'll stop on beat three. There it is. You found the notes. You know that from there you know what to do. Yeah, but combined with A flat. Finger three, just jump. And then maybe add finger two. Still, always stop in the same position because that's the way you establish these pathways in your brain which connect different movements together into this coordinated uh, transition. So uh, an E natural with finger one. Right, always stop in here. Okay, and then finally, a little bit tricky because you have to go from two five, five on A flat to one two three three on A flat. So maybe one more time, just practice that one shift. Right. Then once you feel that these individual cells are making sense and you can kind of do them without too much trouble. Now you can combine and say, okay, one, three there in the end of the measure from C to get to that one, three, I can do it. From B double flat, one, okay, got that. Now from A flat on uh, finger three there, now we're combining, right? And that sudden position shift is I think what probably will provide the greatest trickiness in this etude. Right, that shift. Together it will eventually sound like this. Oh, by the way, one thing that I forgot to mention and then got the reason is it for some reason got cut off. Hold on, let me fix something. Huh. why I'm getting study four. There it is. Um, yeah, I need to include that with half pedal marking. Now done. All right, now we see it. So with half pedal means, I uh, forgot to turn my pedal indicator on. Give me one second. Where, where it is. So with a half pedal, you are able to actually do some nice things. doesn't have the same full sonority of the full pedal, but it's neither dry. 
it's something in between that tries to preserve both of be uh, best of the both worlds. In other words, the clarity of each note. And then at the same time, adds this aura of resonance. So um, going back to this passage, if you have a little bit of half pedal it puts a nice envelope around those notes and then now let's go back to uh, so the beginning we go through it and from measure four, we jump to the second time bar. Unfortunately, I forgot to put it in, in above measure nine there, but same thing. A little bit of that half pedal resonance actually does a magic to some of those sonorities. Now, um, regarding this new line, measures nine, 10, 11, 12, you're mostly playing with the thumb on the edge of the white keys. Except here. Getting confused on my scales there. Um, since this is inevitable, and I'm really not a big fan of sudden jerky moves if I can avoid them, I would probably do this. I, I don't want to do this either. Because playing inside the keyboard is just not fun. Um, so maybe a compromise. How about right here? In the middle of the white key. It makes reach in the B flat a lot more manageable than if I was right here. Right, so halfway there, I get there reasonably easy. Oh, I love those double harmonic scales, but not, not on the last one. That's just a simple G major harmonic scale. Uh, so, let's see. Yeah, keep the thumb on the middle of that G key. Get to the B flat with relative ease. Kind of struggling to find my halfway point, but that's okay because pedal is mobile. feels like almost feels like my full resonance marker needs to be shifted down a little bit anyway um, so once you get past th this passage you you will find yourself um, in this passage but I uh, one quick thing about the scales even though they are not the usual C major or whatever scales um, it's still the same principle. You have two positions and they are outlined with those slurs. So make sure to practice those two position shifts. There it is. And uh, because of what's coming up, I think it's absolutely justified to keep the thumb on the edge of the white keys. But don't over rotate, over deviate, and play the fifth finger on the edge of the this key of D right before measure 13, because you want to have easy time reaching C sharp with finger four. So right, so I would definitely recommend working on keeping the fingers parallel to the keys. Mm -hmm. 
Now in this passage, in measure 13, we have all of those thumb notes on um, the white keys. So you have thumb on G, thumb on E, thumb on G again, B, then well, G, and then finally D, which allows you to keep it mostly on the edge. The only thing to watch out for is right here, between measures 14 and 15, the fifth finger, which is also short, you have to put it on an F sharp. Probably you cannot put the thumb on the very edge because then the fifth finger simply doesn't reach. So maybe right here. But most of the time, yeah, you can av uh, afford to keep the thumb to closer to the edge of the white keys. Now with the pianissimo touch, uh, just a quick note, there are two ways to touch the keys on a piano, especially on the grand piano. One way is you just play it all the way down, right, from top to the very bottom. But if you move it very clo uh, slowly, you get to this stopping point, which feels like something is getting in the way. That's called the escapement. And you kind of have to push past it to get all the way to the bottom. So we're going to play down to that escapement only. And that means that sometimes you might not even sound out every single note you're playing, which is fine, because I recommend uh, when studying these pianissimo, pianissimo passages, that you actually approach it from the other side. And this is something I once heard in the master class with Leon Fleischer, who was working with someone on Chopin's uh, third sonata, second movement, and you know, how do you play it? gentler how do you play it quieter if you approach it from the point of view of playing it louder and then trying to play lighter 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 you get tense and you can't do it whereas if you approach it from the point of view let's play it so light we don't uh, actually make any sound right most of the notes here i didn't even press hard enough to make a sound now you can increase the force needed. Right, now I hit a little few more notes, uh, and uh, but still, some were not audible, and that's fine. You know, I'm continuing uh, to work on adjusting my force, but now approaching it from the inaudible to slightly audible to just the right dynamic. Of course, none of this will work unless you're really confident about those positions. All right, and those are again clearly outlined with the slurs. Now, um, what else shall I say about it? Probably nothing, probably just keep working. But I think, yeah, in this particular passage, half pedal really makes a big difference. This just becomes a blur. Whereas with this, you have that transparency, that kind of mystery surrounding the sound of this. Uh, some kind of diminished scale, uh, no, sorry, harmonic scale, Wh whatever. Um, then we get to measure 17, and we're back in the more traditional chordal territory. Again, all the positions are quite clear, so just practice them. Consider that C sharp in measure 18. You can approach it gradually from being on the edge and gradually moving in, in this kind of diagonal, or you can start closer to the black keys right away. 
whatever you do, just practice it the same way. That way your hand will become comfortable and familiar. Now on this last one, where I just got to measure 19, um, we're playing G-sharp and I would recommend finger 4 so that you're in position for measure root 20. And then you're back to the beginning, which again, I have no idea why DC Al Coda is cut off. I need to check my... Yeah, I, I see the word Coda, so let, let me fix this. Sorry about this. Come on, move. Doesn't want to move for whatever reason. All right, I'll I'll fix it later, but uh, for right now, let's just pretend that we have where it says coda. It means DC al coda. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is as you play through 17, 18, 19, 20, you use that crescendo. Maybe start a little softer. Well, we are softer. We are at pianissimo. So. And then you're back to the beginning. Study the uh, position shifts and you'll be just fine. Remember the, the four and the G sharp, and then. Now, now here I would recommend keeping your hand inside the keyboard as you go through measure 20. So A is played right here. That way, when you go back, you're in a better position. However, if you have, let's say, sh a smaller hand and you need to play this on the edge, then maybe you shouldn't do that. Maybe in measure 20 you should do this. Let's stay on the edge of the white keys with the thumb. And then you do this. So always consider where your hand position trajectory is taking you. All right, so we go back to the beginning. We play all this stuff. Okay, here are my positions. Co coda sign, and we go all the way to the coda. Last four measures. I think those fingers make the most sense. And another scale. some sort of harmonic uh, scale, not sure which. The very end of this etude really make, forces you to consider, am I sitting far enough to the left or could I move a little more? Two, three at the very end, I think. Anyway, so. After those B flats with the thumb, obviously in the inside the keyboard, you can pull back out and keep it on the edge of the white keys. Something like that. All right, well, enjoy this one, and the last one is coming up. <laughs> 